When I sat down on Friday to talk about the coronavirus and to ask people to both listen to and heed government advice and within that advice to do all they can to help out in their local community. This is a time of crisis and at a time of crisis that's what Britain does. We pull together uh, and help each other. I said at the time when I sat down on Friday that the UK's death toll was at 105. It's now just gone half past six on Monday evening and the UK's death toll is now at 335. This is absolutely horrifying and no matter, you know, the, we, we may get swept up in the constant media coverage, Boris Johnson's almost daily updates and briefings. We may get swept up in the confusion and the fear that's surrounding this, but we shouldn't and mustn't forget that actually 335 people have died and 335 families have been devastated. And sadly, that figure is likely to rise. It's, it's sobering, it's sombering, uh, and it drives home the crisis, and it is a crisis that we are facing. So what I wanted to do today was spend some time on the coronavirus and try to demystify it a little bit for us. There's, as I say, fear and confusion surrounding this. So I've spent, uh, I've spent the weekend immersed in coverage about this. I've watched hours of video and read dozens of articles and I will try to put together a simply quickly and clearly as I can, uh, where we are on this, what exactly is happening. So always best to start at, at the beginning. I've got my uh, trusty pad of notes. Uh, always best to start at the beginning. And, and we know this virus started in Wuhan in China. And in December, mm -hmm. a group of, of doctors were talking online in a, in a group chat. One of them mentioned that he had seen what he thought was a recurrence, a resurgence of SARS disease. Now, you remember SARS disease. It's a respiratory disease. Uh, there was an outbreak of it back in 2003, and 800, over 800 people uh, died. And it came from the same global region uh, as the current uh, virus. The doctors who were speaking to each other online about this were silenced by the Chinese state uh, and warned to stay quiet about it. Now, this silence, this inaction by the Chinese government went on for some weeks and a University of Southampton a study, and I will link to this below, this is absolutely fascinating, a, it's, pretty, it's pretty much known now that the Chinese government could have acted and could have prevented this. Um, I will link to the, the most interesting. I won't link to everything I watched or read this weekend because you'll be swamped. Uh, but I'll, I'll link to the really interesting ones. And this is one. The University of Southampton uh, studied uh, and concluded that had the Chinese government acted three weeks prior, they would have, we would have been, it, it would have stopped 95, 95% of the infections that have taken place. Um, China has got to answer for this. And it's a, I know there's a, there's a lot of debate going on at the moment about where the, the blame lies. And as we, as we probably can expect from Donald Trump, he's not, uh, he's not shy about saying what he thinks on this. And he's calling it the Chinese virus. And of course, the United Nations, and he's, he's going up against the journalists who uh, don't know what to do with him. They just don't know what to do with him. One of them asked him uh, whether he thought it was racist to call it a Chinese virus. And he just said, no, it's not racist. He, doesn't, he just doesn't entertain it. He's not playing the game. Um, but is it, you know, the, the, is it right to, to, play, to blame this on China? Well, let's look at the facts. The markets, now the, the doctors who were speaking online pointed to what's known as a wet market in Wuhan, the city of Wuhan, and they identified that as being the potential source of this virus. Now, I watched a documentary about, uh, an undercover documentary about uh, 
wet markets across Asia. They don't just happen in China. They happen across Asia. And here's the scenario. You've got animals taken from the wild who are put into tiny cages, housed in dark, dirty, cramped conditions together. Their cages on top of each other, next to each other. They are crammed into these cages. Uh, these animals are bought and slaughtered there and then. Uh, you, have, you have animals who would never come into contact in the wild, being housed in these conditions together and it's a, a, a and then being handled by humans and the scientist that i listened to said it's not a matter of ingesting uh, the meat from these animals but of handling these animals and the conditions of these animals and this you know it, it brings to light the horrific frankly horrific treatment of animals that is common in these markets and, and for those who know me you'll know how strongly i feel about that but it's also hygiene practices this is not a high standard of practice for food production i'm not it's not racist to say that it's an observation of reality remember that so the united nations as one might expect in all of this, is less concerned about people dying and more concerned about not calling it China virus or Wuhan virus and, and this, this sort of nonsense, which is essentially telling us that the borders are staying open. You are just going to have to get used to this. This is a byproduct of open borders. And this is, and one of the primary key points I want to make today is that this is a result, one of the results of a globalist attitude and a globalist mindset. We are being told not to blame China. We are being told that it's racist to look at all at China uh, or wider Asian practices in food production. We have every right to look at these practices. We have every right to object to them. And it's particularly the case that we have a right to speak when it is spreading viruses, killer viruses, all across the world. Globalism means that if you have a disease in China caused by Chinese practices, you also have a disease in the UK thanks to Chinese practices. We must, must talk about this. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about even placing sanctions on China uh, for this. Well, personally, what I'd rather say is bring our production back home. Our, our pro you know, our, we've got to start making our own products again. That would really, really help uh, with globalism. And here's, here's something else that would help we should have grounded our planes. We should have stopped flights into this country as soon as it became apparent how serious this was. Now, I'll get on to the government's response to this uh, in due course. But a major criticism I have is that we should have the airports, the especially flights from the most the worst affected countries, i.e. China, Italy, Iran are high, have high death tolls in this. And, you know, hold on to your hat because last week, as we were being told to go indoors, rightly, uh, planes were still landing in the UK. To my knowledge, as I speak, planes are still landing in the UK, both from China and from Italy. Now, Italy is the European leader in this. The death toll in Italy, Italy is in the thousands. Uh, people are under a complete lockdown there. Uh, this is cat absolutely catastrophic for Italy. Um, and uh, and I, yesterday we heard, or I read among the many things I read, uh, the government is saying we're a few weeks away in the UK from being at Italy levels. Now, I'll link below to an article uh, from Alt News Media which goes into why Italy. And the answer is quite simple and it's obvious to everyone that the answer is mass immigration, mass Chinese population in the areas of uh, Italy where, where this is particularly northern Italy. Have a read of that article. Um, it's very interesting. As I say, I'm not going to overload you. I'm just going to give you a few of the most interesting things um, and a few of the most informative things that I found. 
so here, uh, uh, back at home, as I say, Italy is is the worst in Europe at the moment, and I'm I'm staggered. I'm staggered to tell you that we still have flights coming into the UK from Italy, at least at the time uh, that I'm speaking to you. Um, across across Europe, we are looking at unprecedented restrictions. People in France, for example, unable to leave the house without a printed document uh, to, to say that they have to go out for food or, or whatever it may be. So here in the UK, uh, we haven't had compulsory lockdown, um, but we have been told or asked the restaurants, bars, cafes were told, uh, and I quite enjoyed when Boris repeated the word telling twice there. Uh, in his announcement, he said, we are telling bars, clubs, restaurants, cafes to close tonight and not reopen. Um, so that's happened. There are, it's, it, it's a very strange, very strange time. Uh, it's, it is the stuff of movie plots. It really is. And I'm not being flippant about it. it it's, it's really a very, very strange time. So all the bars, restaurants, etc. are closed in the UK. Uh, only food shops, uh, post office, uh, essential uh, things are open. Key workers are working. Um, key workers' children are, are not at the moment, but uh, depending on how this goes on, uh, we'll be able to go to school. Um and it, it's uh, at the moment we're being asked to voluntarily stay two meters away from each other in public. I've got to say, I uh, saw on yesterday, Sunday, I saw people at a beach near me queuing, queuing for fish and chips and queuing for ice cream. Uh, I, I, the word, you know, the thought went through my head as people think they're on holiday, um, and I don't quite know my sympathies with the government a little bit on this because I don't quite know how, what more they can do to to try and get this across, this, the seriousness of this across. It is a very, very difficult thing, and it may be that we will be compulsorily, uh, even more str stringent measures will need to be brought in. So very, very difficult time and, and it's very difficult for the government because I do know that they know uh, that it's that what they're asking people is extremely, extremely difficult to do. People with symptoms are being asked to self-isolate. Uh, people at high risk groups are being asked to stay home you know, for 12 weeks. 12 weeks is a long time. Uh, so, yeah, uh, on absolutely unprecedented restrictions on our freedoms already um and i'm not complaining about that i we need to do whatever is necessary to save lives and whilst i don't enjoy the prospect of not being able to meet with people or uh, you know go to a cafe for an unlimited time is actually quite daunting and 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 quite uh, we've got, got to consider this don't we this this is this is an issue to me and I, and i don't really hear it being talked about and it is an issue if we have to stay isolated for a year, what effect will that have on us? I watched a fascinating documentary as well about how it is potentially going to change our online behaviour. Uh, people who don't know, use the internet now will start using the internet. We're going to be, likelihood is we're going to be stuck home, people will be bored. Uh, and even, even television has got, you know, there aren't live sports on television. Uh, even the soaps have stopped filming. You know, we've uh, we're going to people are going to be going to the internet, and and it, it's it we could really see a shift in uh, how people use media over the next year. Anyway, that was a, a very interesting um, documentary that I watched. Now to the government response. Now I don't want to you know sort of pick at the government or criticise the government too much. Uh, because this is an, an incredible, incredible uh, thing that they're facing, and I don't. I'm guessing, assuming it comes doesn't come with a handbook to tell you how to deal with unprecedented crises. However, it must be said that the airline planes should not be landing in this country. Planes should not have been allowed to land here from the high risk countries from the early stages when it became apparent that this was killing hundreds of people. Uh, we should have taken strict and necessary measures at that time to stop people coming into the UK. 
um, the fact that they're still coming in is quite shocking to me uh, and quite a, a, a dereliction. I saw just before I, I started this video this evening, people mashed together on the tube. Uh, I, 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 I do get how difficult this is, but the tube is, a tube at rush hour is the stuff of nightmares to me already so you know we've got to we, we've got we've got to take stricter measures we, we've got to we've got to as a primary point stop people coming into the country surely surely uh this is this is cr obvious this is the first thing one would do right when you've got a global pandemic you stop people coming in to your country and you especially stop people coming in from the parts of the world with the highest death tolls this is staggering to me and to me it tells me that globalism trumps all we are still not willing to admit the dangers of open borders we are still not willing to just stop the mass movement of people we have got to stop the mass movement of people. And you know what? If anything good is to come out of this, it will be that greater understanding of that reality by the wider public, not just in Britain, but across Europe and across the world. This has to stop. We have got to stop willy-nilly allowing people and products and cultural practices to come here from all corners of the world. I will say it till I am blue in the face to the United Nations who talk of a human family. Yes, we are all human, but the, a characteristic of humans is our difference, our developmental differences, our cultural differences, our value differences, our hygiene differences, our food practice differences. And the I'm going to mention it, although I'll be criticised for it, there's the videos going around social media, some of which have been brought to my attention, are nothing short of shocking. Uh, not just uh, hygiene practices, as I mentioned, but cruelty. And there's a notorious video going around of a dog being, I'm sorry to say this, uh, a dog being fried uh, while still barking. And it has horrified people, and rightly so. Uh, but you cannot, you're never going to persuade me of the cultural compatibility between the English, let's say, uh, and the Engli English relationship with dogs. Uh, you're never going to tell, ha tell me that it's a, the same mindset that fries a dog while it's barking uh, than a, a, you know, the, the wonderful English tradition of, of uh, the beautiful breeds uh, uh, bred in this country. And, and, and you, you're never going to tell me that this is all, is all going to gel okay. Uh, it's not. We, we as cultures are often horrified by each other. And we must talk about that. The fallout from this must be that we will talk about hygiene practices we will talk about the movement of food and the movement of people uh, from parts of the world which do not have the same value systems in terms of food production or hygiene this is what it causes and this is not the first time a deadly disease has emerged from asia so I'm with Donald Trump on this. Uh, it is a Chinese disease. It came from China. And uh, this virtue signaling rubbish is just more of the globalists who hate it when the d peril, the danger of open borders is revealed as it so starkly has been with this. Uh, so they're battling back with the usual screech of racist. But we must talk about these things. And I, I frankly object. I object to uh, the the uh, import, the mass import of products from this country, or fr from, from China into this country. So getting back to the government response, really, uh, on the whole, in terms of the economy, uh, Lots to praise in it, I would suggest, and I'd suggest that Boris and Rishi Sunak are going to be uh, popular for this, and rightly so. It's a it's a good response. Uh, I probably would. I, I thought I found myself thinking I maybe go a bit further than that, but uh, pretty pretty good um, response from the government on on this at least. But overall, uh, I'm not happy at all with the government response on this. However. 
like it's unprecedented restrictions that are being placed upon us, it's also an unprecedented intervention by the government um, to prop up the economy because, you know, apart from the deaths themselves, the most frightening thing about this to me is the potential for a extremely damaging, extremely dangerous global recession. People are not able to work uh, and here in the UK we have people working from home uh, but we have people who I, I've, I know of people who've already been laid off. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, people are just not, not able to go to work and it should be obvious I guess uh, as to what that does to the economy. Now how long this will go on for will be obviously crucial because the longer it goes on for the more danger we're in. So the government's response, and I'll just read through a list of some of the measures, uh, and probably the most uh, dramatic of those is that they are going to be paying 80% of wages uh, up to a £2,500 a month limit. The Chancellor said that there was no limit to the amount he was making available for this. Uh, unlimited loans for 0% interest for 12 months from the government to businesses, deferred VAT, uh, until uh, the end of June, uh, business rates abolished for a year, universal credit increased for a year, working tax credit increased for a year, both of those by a thousand pounds and they are going to be launching a national advertising campaign to let people know that they that this help is here from the government and it is it is very welcome and I must say that it was an example of a government stepping up and we this is it is a time of crisis uh people should not feel like they are alone they should not feel frightened they should feel well I mean, and it's natural to feel some fear at this but they shouldn't feel I, I guess they should feel like they have leaders who are going to take the brunt of this on their behalf who are going to do what it takes to protect their livelihoods and to keep a roof over their head and that's when government shows its merit it shows whether it is worthy of the name government uh, and I think it's right and proper that the government stepping up economically to help people in practical measures to actually pay their wages uh, is a remarkable thing but as I say I'm not over, I don't, I, I do hate to be the, uh, a, a gloom monger um, and I do hate to be critical at times like this, but we can't keep, we, we can't keep going like this. The fact that flights are still landing in the UK from countries with thousands of deaths, uh, while Boris Johnson is telling the rest of us to keep two metres away from each other, it's just one of those things again where you shake your head in dismay, you can't quite believe. Uh, so what, when, when? Boris, when government, uh, when are you going to stop allowing people from, <laughs> from allowing people to come on, come into the UK? That must, it must be stopped. It should have been stopped weeks ago, but we are where we are. It must be stopped now. And the longer term lessons of this must be about globalism. We must restore our borders. We must restore our own manufacturing base as well. And we must be able to criticise cultural practices which are unhygienic and cruel and to do so without being labelled racist as usual. Can we just stop with the racist for five minutes. Okay, uh, to finish, I want to to uh, have a look, and I will link to this one below as well, because I think this one is crucial. It's what happens now, and these scenarios for now. And there are three options on, on the article that I, I read. It's a BBC, uh, and you know how I feel about the BBC, but they are actually really good. I've said this before, they are actually really good at collating things and, and summarising things and, and, and ac making things accessible. So they've basically given three options of what, what might happen now. A vaccine, develop natural immunity, or permanently change our behaviour. How about that? So a vaccine is could be, it says, around a year to 18 months away. It would need to work. It would need 60% of the population 
vaccinated. So it's a year to 18 months, not very encouraging, particularly if we're kept at home. Develop natural immunity. Uh, again, this, this would be, uh, I guess it, it's self-explanatory really. Um, if we were infected in, in, in stages and recovered at a big enough scale, we could develop a natural immunity to this. The final one sends chills down my spine. Permanently change our behaviour. Um, that's, that's a worry. That's something that, that's, that's almost like a dark cloud hanging over all of this to me. Uh, and one that isn't really being discussed of how this will affect us socially. If we are kept from each other for a year, it could have uh, real real consequences for, for how we behave and, and, and our behaviour. We may become less social, on a on a much uh, you know on a much longer for a much longer time it it could have uh, i mean it, let's 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 not be pessimistic but to me there's that little edge that little sort of voice in, in the back of it saying i'm worried about how this will affect us if it goes on and on and on um and to not be able to go for a cup of coffee for a year, year and a half, to not be able to pop down the pub with some friends for a year year and a half cinema theatre museum um it's a daunting prospect. Let, let's let's just uh, let's just say that. Okay, um, but on let's let's finish on a positive note because it's difficult to summarize what's going on with a killer disease and and say anything positive. But I do want to end on something positive, and that is that from what we hear, uh, new cases have stopped in China, and life is again from what we hear uh, getting back somewhat to normal in China. Um, this again is to be expected because we simply can't lock people down. We will come up and, and one of the things that worries about the worries me about the permanently behaviour or permanently change our behaviour aspect um, is is how you know how do we how do we change it? Will it from now on will will coronavirus be a part of our life from now on? Uh, will we be wearing masks? Will we have people being charged with criminal offences if they have if they go outside with symptoms of a cold? Will we have uh, things similar as what we've seen we've seen with China and enforcing people into hospitals? Will we have restrictions on the number of people who are able to meet? And will we get so used to this that we'll accept it and adapt to it in a short space of time? And find you know define will we go back to ourselves afterwards? Um, we'll see, we'll see. But the good news is that there does seem to be, I mean, I, I know none of us, it's difficult to trust the Chinese government. Um, but uh, from, what we, from what we do know, things are beginning to go back to normal, slowly, in, in China. Um, you know, this, this is unprecedented, the word keeps getting thrown around, isn't it, unprecedented, but it is. Um, none of us have known this before. And it is, for that reason and many others, a very, very frightening time. But let us do what we can. Let's stay positive, stay optimistic uh, and do follow government ad advice. You know, I, I'm i not being a, a government puppy here. You know, I don't, it's not, I'm suddenly uh, uh, trusting the government. The government should have, should have stopped people flying in here. I, I don't, you know, I don't think... Um, I don't have every bit of faith in the government, no matter what. I think you should know that. Um, but we have to trust the science. We have to trust the scientists. And we have to have faith that our government is going to follow their advice and act in our best interests. Um, however, we shall be keeping a very, very close eye on them and making sure that they are doing in the, in the, during and after this crisis what needs to be done because this is a globalism problem this globalism brought this to our door and that's why the globalists are shouting about racism as per usual because we're finally starting to realize there are major major issues or, or i should say more people are realizing that open borders is causing these problems i shall be uh back i'm going to be doing a lot more videos um over the coming months i can't go anywhere so I shall be back tomorrow and I'll start back on our policy 
videos. But I'm going to start doing a daily live stream. I'm going to start live streaming for an hour a day. I'll let you know the date of that. It'll, it's very, very soon. Where we'll talk about this and other issues of the day. We're all going to be stuck inside now for a while, so let's keep each other company. It's the one of the the you know the the internet is an enormous and terrifying network, um, but it can keep us together while we're not allowed to be around each other, and for that we're very very lucky to have it. So stay safe, everyone. Um, try not to to worry too much. I, you know it's it's a it's a very very difficult and very daunting thing that we're facing, but we shall fight we shall do what it takes to get ourselves through it to get each other through it um and we'll come out the other side and uh i shall be keeping you company so some good news i shall be keeping you company throughout it uh, i'll let you know the start date we'll be very very soon when we'll have a daily roundup of what's going on with coronavirus and other issues I'll be back tomorrow with some For Britain policy. In the meantime, take care of yourselves.